Shalom, and welcome to Via Hafta Yisrael, a Hebrew phrase which means you shall love Israel. We hope you'll stay with us for the next 30 minutes as our teacher, Dr. Baruch, shares his expository teaching from the Bible. Dr. Baruch is the senior lecturer at the Zera Avraham Institute based in Israel. Although all courses are taught in Hebrew at the Institute, Dr. Baruch is pleased to share this weekly address in English. To find out more about our work in Israel, please visit us on the web at loveisrael.org. That's one word, loveisrael.org. Now, here's Baruch with today's lesson. We are fully dependent upon God's revelation. If God does not reveal to us His truth, His word, then we have no way of just stumbling upon that which is right and good. We won't know what righteousness is. We won't understand what is the will of God. We are utterly dependent upon His revelation. And this evening in tonight's study, we're going to see much revelation. There is much in the second part of Exodus 32 that encourages us, trains us, equips us, prepares us so that we might live a life that is right. And that's the key. We want to live according to that which is right in God's eyes. For He is our judge. We don't have to give an account to anyone else, only to Him. And therefore, we need to purpose our hearts. We need to focus our very, very mindset upon His truth. And that is one of the foundational messages of this passage. So with that said, take out your Bible and look with me to the book of Exodus chapter 32. The book of Exodus and chapter 32. Now, we left off last week with Moses having ascended into Mount Sinai. There he received the two tablets, stone tablets, as we emphasize, written with the finger of God. And in the midst of this, we see that Israel fell into idolatry. They fell into a desire of their flesh, wanting to do their will rather than God's will, relying upon their own understanding rather than the revelation of God. And they began to sin in an abominable way before God in this holy place. And we pick up with Moses about ready to descend Back to the people. So again, Exodus 32, beginning with verse 17. Now, as Moses descends, notice who he meets first. He speaks to Yahshua, that is Joshua, the son of Nun. This one who would take over after Moses. This one who would actually lead the people into the land of promise. And notice Joshua speaks, verse 17. And Joshua heard the sound of the people in shouting. Now, the people, they're making a great noise. They're lifting up their voice, but not in praise and adoration, not thanking, not remembering their redemption, not understanding how God has led them here and for what he has led them to this location for. So Joshua heard the sound of the people shouting. And he said to Moses, the sound, now this word is the word kol with a kuf, not a kaf. It means voice or sound, and it's going to be repeated several times in the next verse. So Joshua hears the sound, the voice of, he says, war in the camp. Now, why did Joshua think that this was war? Well, because it was in one sense. 
It was a spiritual battle taking place that the children of Israel, God's covenant people, were losing because they had turned away from the instruction of Moses. Now, here's a principle. You need to write this down. When we turn away from the instruction of Moses, we are embracing the enemy and we are going to be defeated in battle. Just that simple. Now, we're not saved by the instruction of Moses, his commandments. But if we want to live a victorious life, we are going to take the relevance of the instruction of Moses. And under the leadership of the Holy Spirit, we're going to apply that truth for those purposes to be manifested in our life. So they did not do what Moses told them in Exodus 19. They were not paying attention to what was taking place on Mount Sinai. They were all focused upon what they desired. And when they had an opportunity to turn away from Moses' leadership, Moses, the man of God, the servant of God, they did. And they chose Aaron. And notice that they began to instruct Aaron what to do. And Aaron was not a godly leader because he listened to the people. He participated in their plans rather than what a godly leader is, and that is leading people in the purposes of God, his plans, his will. So Joshua heard this, and he heard that there was war in the camp, verse 18. And he said, this is most likely Moses' response, he said, and coal, meaning this is not the sound, and then we have to pause for a moment. The next word is a word, a note. It is going to appear three times. The third time, it's going to be translated in the vast majority of English Bibles in an incorrect way. It takes this word, the first time it renders it, the second time it renders it one way, the third time, totally different. And there's absolutely no basis for their, their understanding of it. The word singing, it has nothing to do with singing. So let me translate this very literally and consistently for what it says. Verse 18, he said, once more, more than likely Moses, this is not the sound of response of power or might. The word is dvora. Dvora. Same word that the name Gabriel, the mighty angel of God, is named after. And it's the phrase here, kol anot vra, which means the voice or the sound of response of what? Might. He's saying it's not this. Then he says, the end kol anot, once more that same phrase. It's not the sound of response of kalusha, weakness. What he's saying here in choosing these two words, gvura and kalusha, he chooses these words, might and weakness. What he's saying here is that this is not a human undertaking. This has great spiritual implications not in the positive sense, in a godly sense, but in a demonic sense. The people here are no longer under the authority of God, but they have turned away from that as they embrace idolatry. Now, we're coming to the idolatry in a moment. We've already seen they've made that golden calf, that molten calf from gold, they ate, they drank, they rose up, they played. That's what we saw. They are embracing idolatry. That is what they're hearing, what Joshua is discerning. And when we are in the midst of idolatry, chasve shalom, which means God forbid, 
when we are in the midst of idolatry, it is an invitation to demonic influence and demonic activity. That is what is being heard and discerned here. It's not physical in nature. There's physical implications, but it's demonic in nature. And that's why he says, call a note. Now he's going to say what it is. The word N means this is not. Now we don't have this word. We simply have the word call a note, the voice response, I hear. He simply hears, not saying. That word doesn't appear there. And this shows you how, how many translations don't actually deal with the text. They just go and see what someone else says. And if it doesn't have their preconceived theological doctrine that they want to impart in the text or some other agenda for their translation, they don't really even deal with translating it. They just copy it. Or they want to read it in English and make it smoother, but they don't deal with the original language. So you look at translations and see, do they have the word singing or something else? All it says here, and I'll read it in Hebrew so we can be assured, that last part after the word weakness, kalusha, it says, kol anot anochi shomea. The voice of a response, I am hearing. What response? The sound of what? Well, the implication is, idolatry and when idolatry is going on there is a spiritual battle not physical but spiritual going on and this is what's taking place at Mount Sinai a place where God intended it and when we go back to Exodus 20 and we see that God was coming to the people to impart to them a change a miraculous change where they would understand his will, what to do and what not to do, and would not have the ability anymore to sin, that they would not sin. A great thing God wanted to do. But what happened? They fell into idolatry, and they received the outcome of spiritual failure. And we'll see what that is in a moment. Move to verse 19. And it came about when he drew near to the camp, he saw the calf, that would be that golden molten calf, calf that was made. He saw the calf and the dancing. Now, this is important because, yes, David danced before the Lord. But more often than not, dancing is problematic in the scriptures not always i said more often than not there can be godly dancing but more often than not what we see is that dancing leads to the the will of the enemy let me give an example of this we see in the gospel accounts we see that there was a young woman she danced before before a leader and that leader was so moved and, and, and inspired by that dancing, not in a good inspiration, but a demonic inspiration, that he uttered things that was rooted in pride, saying, up to half my kingdom, I'll give it to you. And what did that young girl ask for? You know the answer to this? The head of John the Baptist. So dancing, it is Biblical to dance unto the Lord, but I warn more often than not It is not one that's pleasing It needs to be extremely extremely cautious Dancing before the Lord so he saw the calf and the dancing and Moses was angry and what did he do? He cast from his hand now, it's interesting. You'll find that there's many different rabbinical interpretations here, and they're wrong. 
They'll say different things than what it strictly simply says here. Vayishlech mi yadav, which means simply that he cast it from his hands. And the tablets, he cast from his hands the tablets and he broke them. So he willfully, intentionally, through cast from his hands these tablets that were written with the finger of God that we concluded with last week. And he intentionally broke them where? Below the mountain. Now, this is important because under the mountain, what's significant about that? Under the mountain shows the spiritual location of the people. There was a reason why God did not let them ascend. God knew their spiritual condition. And God, he commanded that they stay there and obey his instructions, but they did not. And now, at the foot of the mountain, we see that the people were spiritually deficient, and therefore, what was the outcome? The breaking of the commandments, those tablets. And this is what we see. When we are spiritually inadequate, when we are rooted by the passions of our flesh, when we do not adhere to the instructions of Moses, we are going to be in a spiritual location and condition whereby in the end, the commandments of God are going to be broken. This is what we see imparted to us from this text, the way that it's written to us, verse 20. And he took, this is once again Moses, he took the calf which they had made and he burned it with fire, signifying judgment. What's the obvious progression of the revelation? You break the commandments, there's going to be judgment. So he took the calf that they had made, he burnt it in fire, he ground it up unto dak, meaning very fine, and the implication is like powder. And he sprinkled it upon the face of the waters, we don't know what waters, perhaps, and he made them to drink. Who's them? He made the sons of Israel to drink it meaning that they had to suffer the consequence of their actions. Now, some would suggest that one of the strongest desires is thirst. And drinking shows the desires of the flesh. It also shows here that it would not be something pleasing to drink down. And therefore, when we follow sin, when we there, uh, when we, we transgress the instructions of Moses, we're not going to be satisfied. We're going to be made to receive that which is not pleasing, that which is not satisfying, that which we of our own venition would not take of an, of an, uh, in and of ourselves. So Moses gave drink to the children of Israel, verse 21. And Moses said to Aaron, what have you done? Now, I, again, would, would differ with many of the commentators. Aaron is guilty. Aaron was led astray. Aaron participated. He was the leader that brought about, and it's going to be said three times, this great sin, great as in evil sin, but it means a large sin. So he... And Moses is speaking, and he recognizes the guiltiness of Aaron because he says here, what have you done, or what have the people done, this people done to you? For you have brought upon it a great sin. Now, Moses understands that the people were, were 
the incentive. They were the ones that were encouraging it, but nevertheless, a leader is responsible for his leadership. If he hears the people instead of hearing God, this is an error. And that's why it says, what has this people done to you? For you, and it's very important that we see this, you singular, Aaron, for you have brought upon it or against it this great sin, a large sin. Verse 22. And Aaron said, do not be angry, my Lord. He's speaking to Moses. You know the people that with evil it is. So he's saying, you know that this people have a propensity to evil. What's evil? Well, good is the will of God. Evil is against the will of God. And what he's saying here is that this people have a propensity, a tendency to do that which is against the will of God. Now, Israel's an example. Do they have that tendency? Yes, they do. Is that a unique tendency that's only among the children of Israel? Obviously, no. All humanity has that tendency. It's a human nature because we were conceived in sin. Because we're all children of Adam. So he says, you know the people that with evil he is meaning people i translate it he is it is they are but in hebrew it's singular verse 23 for they said unto me make for us and i can't overestimate that phrase we saw it last week we see it again now make for us not for god not in obedience to him, not to honor him. God's not their thought here. They want to make their own gods. They are associating, and rightly so, Moses and the God of Israel. They want to reject Moses in order that they reject the God of Israel. And therefore, they say, notice it very carefully, verse verse. 22, verse 23. They said unto me, make for us gods which will go before us. We want gods, these idols, to go before us because the man Moses who brought us up from the land of Egypt wasn't Moses, it was God. We do not know what has become to him. And here again, I would suggest to you this is a lie. Moses went up. He said he was returning. Moses constantly went before God in different situations and brought back revelation. They were quickly to reject Moses the first opportunity because they weren't interested in God's revelation. They wanted their own gods, their idols, that golden calf that would go before them. Why? Well, as I said, that golden calf can't travel in and of himself. He can't lead. Man has to carry him. And man carries their gods where? Where man wants the God to go. So they say, oh, we're following God. No, we're following our own desires. We're hearing God. No, we're hearing our own voice. We're serving God. No, we're serving our own flesh. And let me share with you. Today, it is very common, very common for people to use the term Jesus, Yeshua, Jesus, whatever language they speak. They use that right, that glorious name, but they, they, they attach to it their own beliefs, their own desires, their own will, and say, this is what God has told me. Now, I was asked to listen to a, a video this week of a man who said that he had an encounter with, with 72 demons. 
that there was a, a young woman and apparently he was at a conference and afterwards uh, he ministered directly to this young woman and there were other people around and not suggesting that there was anything inappropriate from a morality standpoint but he says that he ministered prayed with her for her for five hours and in that demons from her spoke and he said that she had 72 and he began to to ask these demons who are you what what are you called by and it was so convenient that all the the big sins of of our age abortion oh i am the 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 demon of abortion i am the demon of this i am the demon of this now, I do believe that there is demonic influence in abortion. But then he says, I'm the demon and he uses a particular theological doctrine. Now, I followed up because he gives a teaching on that theological doctrine. And what he says concerning it is absolutely incorrect. And the point I want to make is this. People flippantly say, God told me. If God tells you something, it better be in this book. Or it better be something that can be supported by this book. He says, God told me. God said, to, God led me. Or this demon, he told me that his influence is in this theological doctrine, and I know, not just a belief, the scripture confirms this. So a demon did not tell him that. And when you go and hear this story, in my mind, it's just a little bit too self-serving. And it's no different than what we see here. People want to say, God said, when it's really they said. And the children of Israel, they want, look at the text once more, they tell Aaron, make for us gods that will go before us because this man Moses, who brought us up from the land of Egypt, we do not know what has happened to him. Yes, they do. He went up on Mount Sinai to meet with God. This whole exodus from Egypt, the, the climax was this experience. 50 days after the exodus, there's even a holiday to remind us of that. 50 days after this important event, they are lying. And lying always is an attempt to justify man's desires, idolatrous will. So this Moses, we don't know what happened to him. Verse 24. And I said to them, to whom there is gold, remove it and give it to me. And I cast it, it I threw it into the fire and the calf, this calf came forth. Now, he ignores some information. If you go back up to verse 4, the same 32nd chapter, you see that he took from their hand and he formed it with a instrument, like a chisel. He did it. That's what verse 4 tells us. But here he says something different. He says he just received the gold and threw it in the fire and miraculously the, the golden calf in that form came out. That is not the case. Verse 25. And Moses saw the people that, and we have a very important word, the word parua. Parua in modern Hebrew can mean wild. In fact, we use that term for the wild west in speaking about uh, America many, many years ago. We, we can speak about something that is wild, not reflecting an order, the proper order. Now, it can also be translated as unkept, something that has, has fallen apart, not maintaining the proper uh, specific 
exhortations, the special bright instructions, something along these, these ways. So Moses, he looked, he had discernment, he looked at the people, and he saw that the people, that it was a wild, a unrestrained people. For Aaron says, look at it, Ki Frao Aaron Le Shimtza, which means for speaking about it, Aaron released or uncovered or undid, uh, meaning he brought this about for. And the word here is shimtsa. Shimtsa is a word. In fact, many people, if you know a little bit of Yiddish, shmutz, shmutz is is something that is dirty, grimy, unclean, a spot, a stain. And what he's saying is this: Aaron, you by your action, you manifested how unruly, how wild. This people was how they were stained and notice what it says before the ones who rise up against them here's the key Aaron what Moses is saying Aaron by your leadership you expose Israel to the enemies those who rise up against her realize this is the principle that's being taught we need to realize there is an enemy. We have an enemy, and that enemy uses unclean spirits, demons, and human vessels in order to attack us. And when we are unruly, when we are not demonstrating a proper walk, that testimony, what we're doing is giving an invitation. We are calling, we are summoning the enemy to come and bring defeat upon us and ultimately God's judgment. Because when we get spiritually grimy and dirty, it brings about judgment. That's where this passage is going. Because of the sin of that molten calf, that golden calf, Israel's going to experience judgment judgment verse 26 and Moses stood at the gate of the camp what's what's done at the gate this is where the elders give their leadership that is this is where discernment judgment is given so Moses and this is something seen throughout the scripture judgment is at the gate so Moses positions himself at the gate of the camp. And he said, who unto the Lord with me? And it means unto me, but we'll translate it in English better. Who unto the Lord is with me? And they gathered unto him all the sons of Levi. Now, this confirms God's choice of the tribe of Levi. Now, some point out something here that's very important. It says kol, not with that, that kuf, but with the kaf, not the sound or voice, but when it's with the kaf, it's all. So all or every son of Levi from that tribe at this time, and this would include Aaron. In other words, many see this as suggesting to the reader Aaron's repentance he went with Moses he wanted to reaffirm his allegiance to the purpose of God so all the sons of of Levi were there verse 27 and he said this is still Moses he said to them thus said the Lord the God of Israel every man place his sword upon his hip or thigh and pass and return from the gate to gate meaning every gate of the various tribes you pass through and return from gate to gate in the camp and kill 
every man his brother, every man his neighbor, ish, every man among his, his relatives. Now, what's being said here? Moses asked, who's with me? And many people went to him, including all the sons of Aaron. Specifically, he, he told the sons of Aaron, listen, we have a job to do. We need to place judgment upon those who are unrepentant. And those who are unrepentant, who aren't standing with us, this is what the sword is for. And we see this, look at verse 28. And the sons of Levi, not anyone else, but the sons of, Israel, of Levi, did they did just as Moses, and fell from the people on that day, Be'yom Ha'hu, that day, always a context of judgment. 3,000 men. So 3,000 of the children of Israel, when Moses came back and he said, I'm standing at the gate of the camp. Judgment is going to be mediated out. Who is with me? Meaning, who's going to repent? All the children of Levite, all the sons of Levi, they were there. And God used them. He reaffirmed, reaffirmed his choice of them. And they went throughout the camp, slaying all those who were not with Moses. All those who rejected Moses, they were put to death. And as we say, 3,000 men, three for the number, whether it's 3, 30, 300, 3,000, three for the purpose of documenting, revealing something. Verse 29. And Moses said, fill your hand today unto the Lord. Now, he's speaking to the Levites. And this is an idiom meaning, this day you have fulfilled your hand. You have received authority. You have been called and now you're acting under authority. That's what this is speaking about. A man against his son and against his brother. Meaning that you acted to put those to death. And you placed upon them, meaning this, that you have placed upon, you have placed upon the children of Israel, those who survive this day, a blessing. Now, this is a very important principle. Letet to give unto you this day blessing, meaning judgment, righteous judgment produces a blessing. And the Levites, they have been placed, this would include the priests later on because all priests are from the tribe of Levi. They have affirmed, received once more, and demonstrated this authority and their receiving of it by, by carrying out God's will, acting under his authority to make judgment, but he has placed upon the people, what? That day, blessing. It is only when right judgment is mediated out that the people can be blessed. When the people need judgment and there is no judgment, there is no consequences for wrong teaching, wrong behavior, the blessing won't come upon the people. It's when we judge, and that's why judgment is not in, in, in hate, but it's in love. That's why the scripture says, whom the Lord loves, he disciplines. That's what we're seeing here. Verse 30. And it came about on the next day that Moses said to the people, you have sinned a great sin. Now, this is the second time, this is the second time we see that expression about a great sin. We see it at the end of verse 21. We see it here in verse 30, and we'll see it again in verse 31 in a moment, but once more. And it came about on the next day. Moses said to the people, you have sinned a great sin. And the you here is in the plural. You all have sinned a great sin. And now I will go up unto the Lord. Perhaps I will atone in behalf of your sin. And it says just that, perhaps. 
that I will be able to secure, this is the intent, atonement in regard to and behalf of your sin. Verse 31. And Moses returned to the Lord. Now, the reason why this is here and it's being done the next day is to teach the people. This is what Moses does when he goes up unto the Lord. It's not a, a place of danger. Nothing's going to happen to him. He's in the secure place. He's in the presence of God. And he's doing that for the purpose of serving God in order to receive revelation, to receive what God has for the people and bestow it upon them. And until he comes back, you wait. Don't make that same tragic error that was motivated in sin, which is always to do their desire. They had taken advantage of that. Are they going to do it this time? They are not. So Moses returned, verse 31, to the Lord. And he says, Anna. This is a term of, of petitioning. It is a term of requests. It's the most polite language. Anna, he says, the sin of this people. It is a request. And Moses acknowledges, here's the third time. It was a great sin that they have done in making this God of gold. This idolatry. But, but Moses is interceding. He's petitioning God. And he says, verse 32, And now, if you lift up. Now, most Bibles will say forgive, and that's the implication of it. But it means to lift up. And now, if you lift up their sin. But if not, he says, remove, please me from your book which you have written now we have to be careful because the book of revelation speaks about the lamb's book of life and we need to be very careful here because what does john do in the book of revelation he takes things known things from the hebrew scriptures and he takes them that which is known and understood and he alters them in a new way, taking that context, taking that truth, and applying it to a new revelation. So even though we can learn things from this book in our understanding of the Lamb's book of life, they're not one in the same book. Now, my purpose is not to go into a discussion of the Lamb's book of life. But it's a different book. And Moses is saying something here. Moses is saying, I am with this people. I am, just like a good captain goes down with a ship, Moses is saying something. I am with this people for good or bad. I am connected with them. I'm their leader. And whatever happens to them, I'm taking responsibility. So if they cannot find forgiveness, if my leadership did not bring them to the fulfillment, he says, then I failed. And therefore, erase my name from your book. But notice God's response. Verse 33. The Lord said to Moses, see, he doesn't agree with this. He says, who sins against me, I will remove him from my book. Moses, you just can't petition. It's based upon sin. What are we learning here? There are spiritual laws. And these laws cannot be changed. So God says, it's the one who sins against me that is removed out of this book. Now this gives us insight. Because who sins against God that they would be removed from this book? All of humanity. And that's why there's another book. And that is the book of life. And it belongs to the Lamb. 
And it's only when we receive the Lamb, Messiah Yeshua, Jesus Christ. It's only when we receive Him that we find ourselves inscribed in that book of life. And here's the good news. That, that, that name is there for eternity. We see very clearly this book's different. Now, I know what it says in the book of Revelation. We can turn there in some other time, but realize that there is a wonderful promise from the Lamb's book of life. This is a different book. And we see that the one who sins against God, I will erase him. What is this speaking about? Well, atonement is good. That's what Moses says in verse 30. A kapra. I will secure, perhaps, atonement. But the Lamb doesn't provide atonement. The Lamb of God, Messiah Yeshua, provides redemption. Verse 34. And now... He says, you lead the people to whom I've spoken to you. So Moses received revelation that there's going to be one that God spoke to Moses about. You lead the people to the one I spoke about. Behold, my messenger. Now it's word malach. Sometimes that word can mean angel, but it can mean messenger. Not uh, an angel necessarily. So my behold, my messenger, he will go before you. Now, this is going to be important later on in the next chapter. But we'll just set it aside now. Behold, my messenger will go before you. And in that day that I, and we have a very important word. It is a word, pay Kuf dal, pakad. Pakad, it's translated many different ways. If you go to an interlinear, use the Bible study company, you go and you go to the interlinear and you click on that word and you go to Strong's Concordance, you'll find several different uh, definitions to visit to redeem, to punish, several others. So what is this word? Before we finish up and we translate these last few verses, we need to ask ourselves, what is this word all about? And this word, for example, in modern Hebrew, it is a word that we use for depositing money in a bank account. It's used for other reasons as well and it's a central word for example a uh, central command in the Israeli government works with the military and such is also uses this word in a different form but same three root letter word and three letter root letter word three letter root word that we're speaking about and it means to deposit something, to place something in. And here, God. God is saying, this is a powerful word. He says, I'm in this situation. I'm among you. And what is God going to deposit? That which the circumstances, the condition of the people require. And that's why sometimes it's visited the people. He visits. He's there. He comes. But sometimes it's to punish Sometimes it's to redeem. It all depends. God does what is right based upon the situation that he finds. When he visits them, what is required based upon his spiritual laws, he will do. So it can be judge, it can be punish, it can be afflict, or it can bless, it can be reward, all of these things. And what God is saying and this word is tied to this messenger. Now, we're going to see later on that this messenger is also linked to Messiah. Many interpret this to be a reference to Messiah, and I would go along with that, and we'll see why later on. 
But he says, Behold my messenger, he will go before you. And in a day, the day that I will visit, surely visit upon you their sin. God's going to do something in regard to that sin. And what is that? Well, notice how our chapter concludes. And the Lord and his word, Vayigof, the word Nagif is a play, Magafa, another word from the same root. What we find here is that their sin, God looked at them, and we find that there's going to be a plague placed upon them, and this plague is a form of judgment. And notice what it says. The Lord struck them, you could say with the plague, who the people that had done had made this calf, which Aaron had made. Now, this is shown here to imply the, the joint responsibility, the joint guilt of the people and of Aaron. That they are going to be visited with what? God's punishment. Later day. But it's going to come. And this teaches us something important about the nature of sin. Sometimes that punishment comes immediately, and sometimes it's delayed. Well, we'll talk more about the significance of this one, of this word, and how to rightly understand it in this context and the one we'll learn later on so that we can rightly and properly perceive what God's up to how God's functions in order to bring about a godly change among his people. But until then, we'll stop. May God bless you and shalom from Eretz Yisrael, the land of Israel. Well, we hope you will benefit from today's message and share it with others. Please plan to join us each week at this time and on this channel for our broadcast of loveisrael.org. Again, to find out more about us, please visit our website, loveisrael.org. There you will find articles and numerous other lectures by Baruch. These teachings are in video form. You may download them or watch them in streaming video. Until next week, may the Lord bless you in our Messiah Yeshua, that is, Jesus, as you walk with Him. Shalom from Israel.